Coco, it's great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Thank you, Ryan. It's great to be here. So I was reading about the etymology of the word optimization because of your work. And it's from the Latin optimus or optimum, meant, meant like the best or made way in the 18th century by the French optimisme, probably pronounced wrong, or the tendency to see the best in a situation. So I am curious about this word, and I, I like understanding the meanings of words. When you think of the word optimization, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it means a lot of things. I <laughs> wrote a whole book on it. But, you know, what's interesting to me is, is that it's a relatively new word as far as words go. And it actually came onto the scene through, I don't know if you've read Voltaire's Candide. It's a novella written by a French philosopher named Voltaire. And it's about this guy named Candide who runs around with a bunch of other guys. And one of them is named Pangloss. He's a professor. And a lot of bad things happen to this group, like earthquakes and deaths, destruction. And Professor Pangloss is always kind of seeing the best in things. And, you know, he reminds everyone that every turn of events is for the best because they're living in the best of all the possible worlds. So it's my understanding that the, the word l'optimisme came about right around that time. And Voltaire's novella is how it is sort of catapulted into the into the public consciousness. Hmm. And as it's evolved and, and more time has passed, how has the meaning of that changed in your opinion? Well, I think optimization is, you know, both this sort of cultural force and a set of mathematical techniques. And as time has gone on, we've developed very specific mathematics around optimization. So in technical settings, it, it means a very specific thing or, a, you know, a set of things. And then I think it's also, especially in the last, let's say, 20 years, really infiltrated a lot of our vocabulary, especially if you're, you know, you happen to work in tech or finance, you see billboards, you know, optimize your computer's performance, optimize your own performance, right? Optimize your diet, get the optimal amount of sleep in the right, you know, in the right segments at the, at the optimal times. So it's kind of a word that's come to be everywhere if you, if you look for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could read 10 Twitter threads in the next hour about how to optimize my life, about how to biohack it, about how to deconstruct and reconstruct my morning routine to be as optimized as possible to have a great day, whatever. When you see all of that stuff out there, maybe you don't see it, so I'm, uh, but you know that it exists. What do you think about all that? Yeah, I probably don't see as much as you because I, I right. tend to stay off. I, I, as Twitter. I was asking, I got that feeling like actually Coco's probably not reading that stuff. <laughs> but I look for it as, as kind of like an anthropologist, you know, sure. like whenever yeah. I'm back in San Francisco, I just see the, the latest and greatest and I kind of take a photo and, and chuckle to myself. But, you know, what I see is a couple things. It's sort of this like any trend right it, you, we've we've in many ways lost track of what it actually means you know it's it's what is optimization what is optimizing you know your calendar what what does that actually mean what would that look like and yes there are many twitter threads to <laughs> to tell you different ways to slice and dice that but i don't know i i think it's a word that's definitely bandied around but at the same time i think it speaks to this very real desire to engineer our world and control our world and make it better, right? We that's a, it's a very human desire. It's age old to to make tools, and you know it's why we've lost all our fur. <laughs> it's like we we invented clothes and we invented ways to to keep warm artificially. And so so I think optimization, you know, at least in the the last ten years, understanding of it is kind of a, a an apotheosis of that, of that desire to, you know, make everything the best, your morning, your morning routine. Why is that bad? I don't know that it is bad. And I think that is 
a misconception or an assumption that that people come into the book sometimes thinking an instant part. I don't, I don't do a lot to to dispel it myself because I'm not on Twitter. You know, I'm <laughs> a little mm-hmm. bit more elusive to, technologically speaking. But I, I think optimization has given us so many amazing things. Right? We wouldn't have the lifespans and the health spans that we have today if it weren't for optimizations in agriculture, in transportation, in medicine, even in sort of ways of seeing the world, right? Optimization is linked, your, or the Venn diagram intersects with a lot of enlightenment kind of ideas. It's a search for what ideas are going to be the best to aid in our, in our thriving. But I think at the same time, it's important to acknowledge some of the things we've lost with this way of seeing. And I could talk about those if if you want. Please. Um, yeah. 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 So I I kind of group them into three categories. The first is I call slack or downtime. And it's this idea, I mean, you were an athlete, right? So you know that rest is just as important to performance as you know the actual active part of training if all you're doing is exerting and training you run yourself down and your your muscles don't actually build right your your muscles uh, build in the stage of repair when that when they're resting when you exert and then you rest and so i think we've lost uh, in you know in in a lot of systems right you think about supply chain we've optimized a lot of that slack out of supply chains such that the fragilities are more exaggerated and when they break down they break down in in really big ways the second category i call place or particulars and one of the things that optimization requires or that has allowed it to to thrive as a technology is kind of this flattening or a, an atomization of things, right? Making everything the same, these little self-same puzzle pieces that you can just fit together and add up and calculate and, and make better. So in order to optimize nutrition, we have to think about things in terms of macronutrients or, or calories or minerals, right? And we just, everything is just a, a combination of those things and we just add them up, right? And with that, we've lost you know, some of the more like nuanced or holistic ways of seeing food and and the purpose of food and nutrition and even the things that food is tied into, like community. So that's the second thing. And the third that I think we've lost is a sense of scale and in particular human scale. So optimization, you often hear it in conjunction with, you know, scaling, right? We're going (laughs) to scale things up. We're going to go from zero to infinity. And again, in order to scale, you need that kind of optimization and the automation. But with it, we, you know, when when we have these really big systems, but we're just a small part of them and we don't really know how they work. We don't know how all the algorithms behind our search result really truly work. We've lost that connection with with one another, with the origin of things, with how things work. And I think that that, it's problematic in a lot of ways that we see right now in the modern world. Everything you learned about this, how does it impact what you decide to do each day? Like, I don't know how you, if you plan them or not, or they're scheduled or not, or calendars or not. Like, I'm just curious how it's impacted how you choose to behave each day. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in, in, I should say that in some ways I'm a, a recovering optimizer. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I have always, since I was a kid, been into, you know, I've always been like kind of alert, observant and and driven and into, I wouldn't say like habits or routine in this rigid way, but like finding ways to simplify the things that I want to do. Like I love to, to run, right? So, and running's a really uncomplicated thing. Like I can do it pretty much anywhere. I could do it if I have running shoes or sandals or or whatever it is. And so finding ways, you know, because I know I love that. And if I, if I don't do it every day, I, I get sad. Right. So finding ways to not routinize it because I tend to run maybe at different times every day, but just kind of make it something that, that I do and that built into, to, 
what I want to be doing. I don't, that may be, I don't know if that answers your, your question, but I think at the same time, you know, the recovering part of that is that I, especially in the last 10 or so, so years, I've made conscious choices that have kind of gotten me out of the, the grind a little bit and gotten me out of compelled optimization or feeling like I'm just part of this, this too fast, churning, globalized, modern world. And I don't think it's possible to, to completely opt out of that, nor, nor would I want to. But I've made choices kind of, you know, my own. <laughs> like where you've, <laughs> where you've chosen, preferences. like yeah. where you've chosen to live. to live. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so share more. Yeah. So where did you used to live and where do you live now? So I both grew up in and spent a lot of my adult life in San Francisco at the peak of the, a couple of different tech booms. And about seven years ago, I bought a place on a remote island in a tiny but very close-knit community and didn't immediately move here. But in the intervening years, I, I have made this my home. So that that's definitely one one choice. It's not, you know, it's it's maybe not as outrageous as it might seem on its face, right? We still have internet here. We can you and I can still <laughs> do a mm -hmm. podcast, and we've still got, you know, the mail and UPS and FedEx. So it's just sort of a a step back from the world I was experiencing in, in San Francisco. What what are some of the best and worst parts about living where you live now? Some of the best are, I mean, physically, naturally, it's a beautiful and restorative place. It's a climate that, that works for me. And human-wise, it's, you know, it has taken me some learning, right? I'm a, I'm a city girl. <laughs> and to, I don't know, have you ever lived in a small community? No. Yeah, I've not. I've never lived in like in a New York City either, or like a San Francisco. Okay. So I've always been kind of in between. Okay, okay. So there, it's it's a different kind of set of skills, I would say, and also experiences. Right? There's there's nowhere you can go to be anonymous. Right? You can't simply go to a different neighborhood and go to a coffee shop and read a book undisturbed. Right? Because you know you go to the grocery store and. You're going to run into 10 people you know and have to catch up and so on and so forth so which which has its pros and, and its cons i think the con yes about the pros and the cons i you know i do miss some things about the pace of of cities and feeling connected to you know human uh, that certain stream of, of humanity yeah do you think you'll go back maybe yeah i mean i yeah. spend you know some time especially as this book has come out of yeah. And spending a little more time in, in different cities, which has been fun. Yeah. I yeah. <clears throat> I hear that about New Yorkers, especially. Like they're they've got a lot of pride in their city. When I interview them or I go see them sometimes in person, they're like, you just can't beat the buzz of the energy of the ambition and all of that. And and I like I, I feel that. I I, I understand mm -hmm. that. What do you think of that? Of that like being surrounded by ambition and energy and people fast walking and all of that. Like, what do you think about that? Oh, it's fun. And I have yeah. to ask, like, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't do my research properly, but where are you now? I'm in Dayton, Ohio. So like okay. a decently sized city in the Midwest. Midwestern. Yeah. 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 And where did you, did you grow up in the here. Midwest? Also? I grew okay. up here, moved away briefly after college to play football in the deep South in Birmingham, Alabama, okay. which was yeah. a, a completely new experience for me. It was awesome. Yeah. Briefly went up to Hamilton, Ontario, the Canadian Football League, very brief. So I didn't I didn't live there long enough to fully experience it, although it was similar to home, I would say. So I've been around a little bit, but then and then it then it's then set some roots here in Dayton, which yeah. which is a one of those places that's like yeah, it's like a solid suburb type community for people that with a lot of really good people that work hard and and uh, but it's not overly big and it's not overly small. And probably some generational history, right? <laughs> for sure. And it's it's not a I don't think of Dayton as a place where people are, are in and out, you know? <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I mean, the Wright brothers were from here and their bicycle shops down the street. So like that's, there's some cool history. There's some pride. There's a, a air force base here. That's got, got a lot of people. So yeah, there's some of that going on and yeah, most people are, are sticking around. So I think yeah. that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah. 
I mean, you asked about the the energy of yeah, New yeah, York Big and, C. Yeah, I, you know, personally, especially if I'm in the right mood, right? I'm a mostly introverted, but I do thrive sometimes off of that that energy, and the, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I I personally could could live in New York full time for for very long, but I love visiting. What's the process like to get your doctorate at MIT? The process. Okay. <laughs> you apply and then, I mean, a PhD is, it's different from uh, undergraduate, from, from a college experience in that a large yeah. part of it is self-directed, right? You, I mean, it's just so rare. That's why I'm just curious. I mean, I don't come across these at yeah. MIT, yeah. MIT PhD hardly ever. So I'm just like, wait, you're one of the yeah. very, very few that I've ever met. So I'm, I'm fascinated by like, okay, how yeah, did it's, this, it's, yeah. it's actually, it's not as rarefied as, um, <laughs> as it might seem. And I know that's easy to say for, for you know, having done it, but I, yeah. I, I sometimes liken it to baking bread. I don't know if you've, you've ever delved into that world, but it's, hmm. it's one of those things. If you taste, you know, if you you know, somebody brings bread to home baked bread to a party and you, you've never baked bread yourself. It's like something it's like magical, right? It's like yeah. you you did that, right? Like I thought bread like comes from a bakery and they've got all these secret recipes and you just did that in your oven, right? I, I think PhDs are are kind of like that. It's like once you kind of seen the the inside, it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's not a you know it's a, it's like baking bread like you you do it a few times and you follow the recipe and then you make some modifications and it's like it's easy it's just flour and water right and <laughs> phd is kind of the <laughs> the same thing it's like you, you take a couple classes and then you have to propose this original research project in which there's this like i don't know if you've seen this xkc cartoon but it's like you know, Zoom is there's kind of like this balloon and the PhD is like the, the balloon is kind of our our sphere of understanding. And if like you go zoom, zoom, zoom in on like one tiny little corner of it, and that's like what a PhD is. So it's this very narrow in order for it to be original research, right? You you kind of have to go go pretty narrow. So you do that and then you you get your committee together. I was, you know, it's called a dissertation defense, right? Mm -hmm. I was always told that the the best the best defense is a good offense, right? <laughs> you might mm -hmm. appreciate that from, from mm -hmm. sports. So you kind of, I poked a little fun at each of these old guys who was on my my committee, and that got them laughing. And then, you know, you you defend your your whole thing. By the time you get to the defense, like they've pretty much approved it anyway. So they ask some questions, and then, you know. A few weeks later, they sign a paper, and you're a you're a doctor, but not not the kind that can save lives. <laughs> <laughs> Are you glad that you did it? Yeah, it was. I at the time, and you know, I I I don't know if I could do it again at this stage, but mm -hmm. to do something that was kind of in the world of ideas, self directed, original, that was really fun. I mean, it was, there was challenges for sure, but it was fun to create something new. And another part of it that, that was really fun was to be in kind of this playground of ideas, the whole Boston areas. I, I don't know exactly how many, but there are maybe like 50 universities or, or something there. So a lot of people you run into, you know, there are a lot of 20 somethings, right? Studying some weird esoteric thing and you end up having, you know, crazy conversations about middle, medieval literature or something and, and learning something new. <laughs> hmm. I want to dive into your book, Optimal Illusions. And there's a, a great section about Las Vegas. I was reading about the numerous stories within there and I want to pull the thread on a few of them. <clears throat> Zappos has been in the news for various reasons. Uh, over the years, uh, certainly a tragic story with their founder, but I would I want to focus more on why you went there to study them and what are some of the key takeaways, your key learnings from studying their culture. I know one of the your visits was during COVID, so you weren't able to actually go and visit in person when you wanted to. But what did you learn from studying them, their culture, and their company? Yeah, I mean. I use Zappos as an example because they were one of these 
relatively early, you know, web retail companies that really took off in a in a big way. And optimize, I, I use them to talk about these components of optimization that I think they did really well. And those are atomization. Uh, I touched on that before. Abstraction, which is kind of taking these atomized units and abstracting them into a model, a mathematical model that allows you, for example, to recommend shoes to somebody that they they might like based on their preferences or to, you know, to build a model to optimize your your supply chains uh, and your delivery times. And the third is automation, which obviously they, as they grew, they did very, very well. So, you know, I, I talk about that, but something that's interesting about Zappos is that as a culture, they were, or as a company, they were interested in quote unquote, optimizing their, their culture as well. So they mm -hmm. made certain very conscious choices to maximize these metrics that they developed of employee happiness and also of con customer happiness. So they moved from San Francisco to Las Vegas, which was, you know, a lower cost of living community. If, if you look at that cynically, it was a, a very smart corporate move. If you look at it kind of, you know, from the, the story that they tell, it was also to boost culture and allow employees to be closer together and and more tightly knit and live in a place that had a better quality of life than a very expensive Bay Area. So yeah, I'll pause there. It looks like you got a question. So uh, the, one of the things about the optimizing culture and I, the other word I think of is the efficiency. And I, I know, in a way, I'm going to ask you for advice. So this is more personal, but maybe it could be, hopefully help others beyond me. One of the, just one of the services that I, I offer is calm learning leader circles or essentially like mastermind groups. They're paid. So it's a service I provide. And when I meet with like friends, MBAs, I've got an MBA, so I understand what the world's like, but they look and I say, Hey, look at my processes or see where like I'm messing up or what could I do better? And when they look at that one and see that everyone who applies gets a personal email from me, and then if they make it past the stage, I do all of the interviews. And it is a highly, highly inefficient process from, and they go, well, you could automate this part for the response because there's hundreds and hundreds of people applying mm -hmm. and you could automate this part and then automate this part. And I'd say what I respond is, do you know how many comments I get from people that, that they say, I can't believe how quickly responded and how personalized the response was because I always mm -hmm. I always write and comment about something specific that they wrote in their application. So you can't automate that process. I mean, maybe with AI you could, I don't know. But to me, that would ruin it. The optimization and becoming more efficient with that specific thing would ruin the personalization, would ruin the, the would ruin the feeling that person has. After they and the application's not a short thing for them to do. They're investing time to apply, and so I've get, gotten this advice multiple times, and I've just rejected it because I think not everything should be optimized. Not everything should be super efficient. If I'm thinking about their feelings and how I want them to feel, even if they're never going to pay me a dollar, they're not going to be a part of it. I want it to be a personalized, cool experience, even if it does take a good bit of time on my part. So, I mean, I guess I'm leading the witness here, but I am curious, like, just to hear <laughs> that, that overall, that overall feeling, we're probably on the same side here, but I'm just curious what you think about that and feel free to expand. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you and yeah. I would say, or I would ask, right, it would probably ruin it for you too, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, you lose out on the personal touch and like, I hear the Airbnb guys would go around and take the pictures themselves at the beginning. I don't do it anymore. And it's, and say, well, how do you scale? Well, we do things that don't scale. You know that phrase from Silicon Valley, but like I like I like an element of that. Like I, I like the feeling of you maybe do something that you know will never scale or can't scale, but it's like a personal touch thing that is that definitely makes me feel good. But I feel like it, it enhances the experience of the other person, even though there is no necessary way to scale it. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like you're at a juncture, or you you've sounds like you've kind of made your decision. You're not. Well, I mean, I, I think you almost have to make the decision like, 
are you okay with that this thing doesn't become gigantically huge and you don't have like 17 groups running at the same time? Yes, I've made that call. Like I'm not trying to optimize it so that seven, I have 17 different teachers and I'm trying to like automate it. To me, I guess if you wanted to scale as a word you used earlier, you would do that. You would automate the process and you'd have other people in, in, the, in the thing to, to do it. I just don't like the thought of losing the personal touch, even if maybe it can make you more money. Yeah. Yeah. And Airbnb is a, an interesting example too, because I, I do feel now there's been a little bit of maybe not backlash, but disenchantment yeah. as more Airbnbs not only take over like regular housing in, in a lot of cities, but also, I don't know if you stay at Airbnbs ever, but yeah, you know, I do. some of them are I, I think the the spirit with which the company was was started, right? It was you back in the day of the the couch surfing and sure. so on and so forth, and it, which was a very community oriented kind of thing. And as it grew big and more unwieldy, right? A lot of these places they they aren't personal, right? It's it's effectively the same as staying in a hotel. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I do you think it's possible to maintain that as you scale? I, I I wonder if those two things aren't in conflict. I don't know. I, I mean, maybe it's hard to, I'm not smart enough at, at, as of this date to figure that out. Maybe it's worth trying to, but it seems like there is only a certain amount of time. And so if you do decide you want it to be this gigantic thing and you like the personal touch and you like the per per personal responses, then I don't know. I, at some point there is going to be a conflict there where you aren't able to do it. So interesting thing to me is that the norm is always to say, well, this is how you, you've shown the market has proven that they want it. This is how you scale it. And then that's just what you naturally do as opposed to saying, why don't we keep this thing kind of at a reasonable size that still is going to do really well business wise, but it doesn't have to like get giant so that it's unsustainable for you to have a personal touch. Like that's the part that I'm not ready to go there yet. Cause I like that. Yeah. I, I like that element. It's fun. Like it's fulfilling. It's cool to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, my sense is that particular part of it is a, is a relatively new thing. I mean, I, you went to business school, so <laughs> yeah. you probably heard it a lot there. You could tell me, you know, how, how prevalent it is this, this notion of scale. And, and I do think it's, sort of driven by this myth of that everything should work the same way that the recent su successes in Silicon Valley yep. have worked. And it's like, I think we're finally in the last couple of years, like starting to come to terms with like not, you know, companies in the physical world, they're, they're not Facebook, they're not Twitter, they're not Google, they don't, don't you know, there are physical limitations to scaling them in that way, not to mention kind of the the cultural or aesthetic limitations that that you point out, but you know we've built this these like totally ridiculous funding models or, or belief in these funding models around like maybe you know what worked for like ten companies yeah. that are already mature at this point. Yeah. How does your business work? Like, how do you? What are all the things that you do to support yourself financially? Yeah, I mean, I run, I worked for a while as a data scientist and heading data science teams in tech companies, mostly tech companies with like a kind of scientific bent. Mm -hmm. And I did enjoy, you know, that that I, I both hated and enjoyed that, uh, that like bubbly feeling that, that existed around the time. But now what I do is mostly consulting. I mean, I I write, I hope to write more, but I run a small consulting business where we work with, again, scientifically inclined companies, whether they're startups or, or larger com or teams within larger companies to help come up with, whether it's, it's modeling or data platforms or kind of a general data approach. And yeah, that's been that's been really fun. I, I hmm. like learning about new scientific domains and kind of how they might be impacted and by new computational techniques that, you know, have, have been being developed over the last couple decades. And also, if I'm really honest, I kind of like 
bursting the hype bubble a little bit. A lot of these companies will come to me and say, I want the, you know, the, the AI pixie dust or whatever. It used to be machine learning pixie dust, but now they've just, you know, changed <laughs> the word. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I don't know. I mean, I, we could, that's a whole separate conversation about how much of, to me, this is just a lot of hype. There are some right. amazing computational techniques, but like, you can't just plug things into chat GPT and throw some pixie dust on it and get all the answers <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned writing and from a leadership perspective, I think it's just the ultimate clarity of thought tool and leaders need to need to be clear thinkers. And you're a beautiful writer, highly, highly skilled. It's obvious you've worked that muscle and it's so strong. I'm just, I love to hear your overall philosophy and thought process on like the art and science of writing, how it creates clarity for you. Like what's your writing practice? When I see somebody write such beautiful text over and over and over, I'm like, goodness gracious, <laughs> how does she do it? You know, you get a little envy, I'm not going to lie, but in a way that's good because it's a motivator to get better. What's your overall philosophy? What's your process? How do you use it to learn all, all things writing? Gosh, well, my, my ears are burning. <laughs> Thank you for those. <laughs> Sorry. Those I, I, that was like 19 compliment. questions, which is obviously <laughs> not how you should do it. But, but I mean, I, I'm genuinely curious. Yeah. I'll apologize in advance because I don't know that I have a, a good or a, a replicable okay. answer. It's, it's something I love. And I, I'm really not, I mean, I'm very flattered that you would think I <laughs> have a, a long history or a, a process. I've always written but this is the first thing I've written that's, you know, for the, besides a few little articles and academic things here and there, that's for the public eye. And I, I learned a ton. I mean, I, I don't think my, my process was anywhere near efficient, so to speak. Not that I would necessarily do it. I, I think it was necessary to do it in an inefficient way. Let's see, what have I, you know, in terms of like tips. And, and I also don't think, I think I'm green as a writer. So I don't yet have like, you know, the Murakami, whatever, wake up at 4am and write a thousand words or, you know, all these yeah. kind of rules that, that people have found they, they work for them. I, I had one thing I found for myself is it, I do need open-ended space. So when within a single day, I'm trying to write and do this and do that, you know, and keep all these other balls in the air, that's very difficult. It's not like a, I can't do it mechanically. So, and I think that's true for, for many people, for many creative acts, right? You need kind of that, that time for, for things to, uh, to percolate and for ideas to kind of emerge from the mud <laughs> mm -hmm. is just as important as like the, the practice of sitting down every day at 5 a.m. and punching out a thousand words you said you said you've you love it and you've always done it so did you have like a journaling practice like as a kid growing up going to college like what was that like yeah you know at, at different times in my life i've kept journals or, or diaries i love writing letters to friends i have a few dozen short stories that you know are in various stages of <laughs> disrepair that, that i've written over the years so all of it, I keep, you know, little notes all the time. I'm scratching notes somewhere or other. Yeah. Are, do you write as a, as a practice or? Yeah. Yes. I think it's very hard. I published two books and, and working on the third. And the, the reason I do it actually is, is because I think it, there's no greater tool for learning. My first book's called Welcome to Management. And it was on, on that like leap from individual contributor to first time manager. And I, I wrote it mainly, I remember selling the proposal to a publisher because that was like a really tough time in my career where I just basically fumbled the whole thing. I mean, I, I made every mistake a first time manager. You hope they don't, but they do. And, and so it was like almost an act of, of trying to help others not make that, make those same mistakes. But the, the, the interesting thing about it is, you know, you write a book proposal. I don't know if your was like this or maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but for me, mm -hmm. you write a proposal and they, fo the publisher focuses so much on the marketing plan and how are you going to sell it and what's your platform and all that stuff. And then you write a couple sample chapters, at least this is how it was for me and a lot of the people that have been on this podcast that helped me put my proposal together, my first one. 
But then they say, yeah, great. Here's your book advance. Go write the book. And it's like, oh my God, I've only written like <laughs> 6,000 words. I still have 60 more thousand to go. I have no idea what I'm talking about. And so the process, I thought I did. I thought I was like an expert and I definitely wasn't even close. So the process of getting from selling it to the, a, a publisher to then turning in the final manuscript was an amazingly great learning experience because you know so much research so much writing and rewriting and editing and working with others my first drafts were terrible right and then just to get to keep going so to me i like to do it almost selfishly as an amazing tool for learning but i know that everyone has their different reasons but i'd say that's that's a big one for me is is just because i learned so much through saying okay i'm committing to doing this and then you go and it's like works as a forcing function for so much good learning to happen. Well, did you learn, are you talking about the actual topic like management? Absolutely. Or writing? Both. About writing? Both. Yeah. Oh, yeah. both. Well, I mean, you know, I try to set all different rules. I don't know if you had any of these where it's like, okay, for the next two hours, I'm not doing anything else. Now, I don't have to write, but I can't do anything else, right? You can't watch TV, can't look social media, can't do anything like you have. So like eventually you get bored and you start writing or whatever. I mean, maybe you have, you had some little bit of research into some of those, some of those chunks too, but that is, I, I think you learn a lot about writing and you learn a lot about whatever the topic you're writing about when you're forced to do it. This is why when I work with leaders and advise them, I push all of them to create a form of a writing practice. You don't have to publish it. I mean, I'd like to maybe read some of it, but you don't have to publish it for everyone. Let's work the muscle of getting the thoughts out of your head onto the page. I think it'll, makes, it'll make you a better communicator, it'll make you a better speaker, it'll make you a better email writer, which is important for leaders, like all these things. So that's, that's why I'm just a big, big proponent yeah. of it. And when I see really good writing, I can't help but, but say, you know, how'd you do it? What do you do? How do you get all <laughs> that good stuff out? Like that's, that's what's fascinating to me. Well, I'm, I'm curious, was, was, it, was it easier the second time around? It, it it was i would say it was easier there are still parts that are were it was a grind though but at least i like had felt like i've been here before so i could draw from some of that i understood the structure a little bit i worked with similar editors so they kind of knew the flow of things the back and forth the, my book publisher it, it was a lot less red coming back right a lot less red crosses and ink coming back mm -hmm. i actually had an editor who, who printed out the whole thing and would do it with a, a pencil like a red colored pencil so awesome. like that was like real so it was probably a little bit better but still hard though and even this third time still really hard but i guess you just know a little bit about how it works even though like and you hope you're better i mean you hope you get better each time i don't know do you do you feel like like are you already working on your your next one um i have an, a strong idea so yeah so yeah. where are you at like in the outlining phase or what or what do you do how do you do that yeah exactly so in the in the outlining and kind of proposing phase of it but like you said i felt with the first one even though you know i i had the whole structure and the outline and i knew what i was going to say in every chapter for the proposal by the time i <laughs> got down to writing it i was like Oh my gosh, like, like so much changed, you know, and yeah. um, just as you like, I was also traveling at, at the beginning, you know, I, I got the deal in, I want to say June of 2020 or June or July. And I was like, I got to do these interviews. And it was the sort of the early stages of the pandemic. And I wanted to drive around the country in part, you know, to do these interviews and in part just to like, see that kind of weirdness when nobody was on the road and all these, you know, different places mm -hmm. with very different kind of cultural reactions to what was going on in the world. So I think it did. I, I don't know that the structure or the outline or like the main point of any of the chapters really changed, but mm -hmm. kind of the feel of them really evolved over. W over the what was that process, process like? Right. Yeah, yeah. What, what was it like Drive seeing around. different parts? Yeah, seeing different parts of yeah. the country during a, a a crazy time in our a, a time of, of of our lives that we'll probably never forget. I hope we don't because yeah. that means like yeah. something crazier doesn't happen. But <laughs> but what what like what was that like? Because you experience 
all different types of people and how they responded. And, and you know, there's division yeah. and weirdness in our country right now and all the time, I guess. Well, thank but you, what was thank you so much for asking because my editor actually made me <laughs> take out. I had all these little bits, like little anecdotes about. Why they make you take that out? Oh, okay. I think it was a good decision. She was like, this isn't going to age well. Like, it's not, you know, my book's not about the pandemic. It's not, yeah. you, okay. you know, like if, if it had been a book about like cultural responses and divisions yeah know, during the time of covid like <laughs> that would have been one thing yeah. they, they were just more like little quirky kind of observations you know i i agree with you it's really the the only time in in my memory where not i mean there have been other times where the united states like it's like everybody everybody's eyeballs were looking at the same screen like september 11th for example mm -hmm. but here like the entire world was looking at the same screen and they were seeing slightly different things everywhere you know but we all like more people knew i, I remember reading this somewhere more people knew the word coronavirus or, or you know sort of that this was a thing then could tell you who the president of the united states was which was pretty astounding right and so what did i what did i see i mean one of the things i two of the kind of like things i tracked in every state i went to were attitudes towards like masks or, or whether like mm -hmm. you know attitudes towards whether this was like the scariest, you know, doomsday thing that had ever happened or like this, it's not even happening. Right. So that was an interesting kind of it, like benchmark. And I would also track people's response. Like if I put on a mask or I didn't wear a mask, right. Like I, I feel like masks became in some ways this like tribal signifier, right. Like, yeah. Oh, she's got a mask. She must be one of those like coastal people. Or if I don't have a mask, like I remember going, you know, I went to, Boston. And I, you know, because where I am, there was sort of a, a general kind of concern and concern for others. And there was masking indoors, but outdoors, because it's a rural place, like nobody really wore masks. And I remember going to the first city I, or one of the, the first like coastal city I, I stopped in. And it was like, people were wearing masks on the street and I went for a jog and I wasn't wearing a mask. And I was like, people were like, you know, looking at me. So there were just those little, like those little indicators that, you know, many of us will probably forget or, or just like, we're so salient at the beginning of the pandemic, but like now it's sort of, it's, it's kind of faded. <laughs> it's wild though. If you look back on your phone, I don't know if you have this, but I just was doing this. And you see some pictures where actually you leave the mask on for the picture. You see some where it's sitting down on your chin. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, yeah, we did that for a while. Like we, yeah. And it's, yeah. it's like how fast we forget. But that was like a big yeah. part. Your kids are wearing them. Like, oh, my goodness. I it, It's just wild, like how, I don't know, we just move on. But like that was a massive stage part. When everybody was like maybe like a couple of weeks when everybody was like scrubbing their mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what's wild is you never like. Well, we sit back and laugh now, but it's like in the moment. Yeah, I don't know. May, hopefully, we're better better prepared for whatever crazy thing happens next. Yeah. But it's hard yeah. to hard to hard to really know. You yeah. what? One of the uh, left hand turn here for a second. But getting back to Vegas, I don't really play as much anymore. But like, I used to love playing poker. Done it in Vegas. Done it with friends. And your friend Nell, who I guess you met through a roommate. What what did like what was the purpose of studying poker? And what did you learn from studying the World Series of Poker when you're out in Vegas and, and from your friend Nell? Like what, what did you draw from from all of that? Yeah. And she's sort of a, a compilation of a, a few people I met along the way, a few female players. I use poker as an example, first of all, because it's, you know geographically relates to to las vegas but also because compared to chess for example it's a very difficult game to optimize so we solved computers solved quote unquote chess like a few decades before we even were close to having a computer program that that could in expectation not even every time beat a human at poker so it's interesting to me that it's a game 
with like a relatively relatively simple set of statistical kind of rules and probabilities. But layered on top of that are these mental models that players have of of one another. And a lot of time and energy is is spent on, you know, doing the game theory and thinking through what's your best strategy conditional on who you're who you're playing against. And a lot of that is internalized, but a lot of that is like actually done programmatically through through coaches and trainers i don't know if that was your experience or, or kind of how far you got in well not anywhere near that level but uh-huh. i i watched it on tv actually a decent amount because i'm more fascinated by like just the combination of things at play with the strategy with the math with tells with table talk with i mean the psychology the Everything about it to me, for some reason, it's like I don't really even play a lot of golf, but I still like to watch it. I don't know why. Same mm-hmm. way with poker. I'll watch them play just to see. And sometimes I'm amazed. I'm like, how do they know? Like, How do they know? I get at the table and I never feel that confident like they do. And I know it's repetition and they're smart and they know how to think through it. But I don't know. So to me, any anytime I like see somebody who seems world class at something that I think is really hard and they make it look easy, I'm just – Mm-hmm. curious to to learn how and so when you're writing about it, i was like oh yeah I- I- interesting that she chose poker as you could have chosen a million things and you chose that as one of the things to write about so that that's that's where i was coming yeah, from yeah yeah no i i've thought a lot about like why i would be a ter- i've never played poker beyond <laughs> like you know if just some casual games but never with any real money involved and i i think it would be it wouldn't suit me, you know, and I've, <laughs> I've thought a lot about like why some people I know, why it suits them. And, and I think it's, it's like your sensitivity to losing or to regret, right. Goes down the more you play, the more experience you get. So I think it's, it's both like your skill improves, but also you can like sort of ride these waves that psychologically yes. for most of us, like, you know, losing, five thousand dollars in like 20 seconds like it would be terrible right it's like (laughs) and that would you know psychologically like that would impact me for the next two days at least right so but like to be able to lose like many multiples more than that and just keep playing and take it all in stride like i I think that takes a, a particular character type and also a lot of practice yeah well, and to you have to com- compartmentalize lying, right? Mm-hmm. Like lying is a part of the game. You you have to be good at it sometimes. You have to be good at seeing other people that mm-hmm. and like I'm actually bad at both because I learned over the years. I, I like Jim Collins talks about making the trust wager and like believing in people and you don't have to earn trust. You've got it, and so that way. When they bet, I'm like, oh, they must have it, right? Like, I guess I fold, right? Or like, mm-hmm. okay, maybe this is a good time for me to bluff. Uh, I don't yeah. feel good about it, so I don't. Well, you're going to be a yeah. losing poker player if you yeah. think people are never bluffing, and if you don't bluff, you're <laughs> going to lose. So it's like that's – in a way, I'm fascinated by people who do things that I just am not either can't do or I guess just haven't really been good at doing I don't know yeah. if that's weird, but that that's yeah. how, what I gather. Yeah, no, it's it's a, like you take things at face value and like poker's not a, a face value, right? It's, no. Um, no, I don't know. It's, it's, like it's, it's not it's, checkers. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. But as, as we wrap, I'm just curious, like o- overall, great title, by the way, Optimal Illusions, like, hmm, hmm. I like how you did it. What, what made you or how did you come to that title and how do you feel now that it's out in the world and you're getting responses about it? The title is going to sound woo woo, but the title kind of just came to me. Yeah. <laughs> we had a working title, which is, you know, it would have been okay, but I don't even remember. I was kind of just daydreaming and making a list of things. And I was like, how about optimal illusion? It just sort of, just cool. sort of arrived and it works because I, you know, I do talk about some illusions in the, in the book. Second question, how do I feel? Honestly, if I'm really honest with you, because I'm I'm a bad liar in most not always, but I'm a bad liar in most <laughs> most circumstances. Honestly, like I it was like slightly distressing to me that it would be out in the world. Not because I don't want people to read it, mm. because but it's like it it's it was this very personal thing. And when you put anything out there, right, it becomes 
it, it becomes it belongs to the reader, right? Yeah. Um, I think Michael Lewis has this great quote that's it's like you don't know the book you've written until your readers start reading it, right? Because mm -hmm. it's been really fun to do things like this and and talk about it. But I have to say, I was like a little bit shy. I was like, well, what if somebody sees something in it that I didn't intend or that that was like it, something that they're deriving from it? And I, I think I'm starting to come around to that and see like, that's actually beautiful. Like you, you know, somebody's taking away something that I didn't even think of and and making all these different connections. But um, there there was a little bit of like chagrin or or like fright in like putting it out there. Very cool. Well, it's... As I mentioned, extremely well done. The book is called Optimal Illusions, The False Promise of Optimization. Coco, really well done. As I said before, I love to continue our dialogue as we both progress, talk writing, talk everything that goes into this. This is a topic that you write about that I'm fascinated with and you've, 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 done, you've done it beautifully and I can't even imagine the cool stuff that's gonna happen next, but thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you so much, Ryan. I learned a lot as well. Love it. Thank you.